college and university campuses. A college and university recycling coalition webinar sponsored by Alcoa and Keep America Beautiful. My name is Rob Gogan. I'm the Recycling and Waste Services Manager at Harvard University, and I'll be your moderator today. And I hope you don't mind, I'm, I'm counting uh, proceeds from selling my recyclables in the background here. So I'm glad we have a speaker folder that I can use two hands here to bundle up my nickels and dimes. Uh, all of you have your lines muted, but you can submit questions to us at any time using the questions panel on the right side of your screen. We have over 100 listeners today, so we can't uh, listen to all your questions verbally. These webinars are designed to provide you with information and perspectives about recycling at the collegiate level. We want to make sure we are addressing your questions, so we encourage you to ask questions via the question feature of your computer screen. We'll pause throughout the presentation to take your questions, and I'll be the one to verbalize the questions as they come in by text and try to get to as many questions as, as we can at the close of the session. All of the questions will be transcribed and included on the College and University Recycling Coalition website within a few days. This webinar is part of our free Kirk Technical Webinar Series. We're hosting these webinars nearly every month. The next session will be on October 13th, as the first of a two-part session covering market assessment and program planning. Nope, not that one. The next one will be November 10th, that is, Market Assessment Program Planning Part 2, uh, Planning Accordingly, Based on the Market. The second part of the series, but the third part, I should say, will take place on December 8th, when the topic will be equipment. Uh, and we have a fancier name for that, including and Baylor's, oh my. Uh, right, uh, if I could find the right paper, I'll try to get you that later. All sessions will take place from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can locate more information about the Kirk webinar series on the Kirk website at www.kirk3r.org. I'm pleased to be joined by a great panel today. We are very lucky to have with us Natalie Starr and Ted Siegler from DSM Environmental Services, Inc., who are going to give us a state of the market overview. And unfortunately, Natalie is a little bit voice challenged today. So Ted Sigler, her partner, uh, we've been told might do some of the talking for her. But I know both of them, they're dynamite speakers. They're both extremely well informed about the markets. Uh, then we have Beth, oh, I'm sorry, not Beth, and then it'll be Steve Alexander, from the Association of Post-Consumer Plastic Recyclers, then Bill Moore, President, Moore & Associates, then Beth Schmidt, from, who's the Director of Recycling from Alcoa North American Rolled Products, who's going to talk about aluminum recycling. And uh, we have to pay special attention to Beth because she's with Alcoa, our generous sponsor. Uh, then Lynn Bragg, who's going to be talking about glass recycling from the Glass Packaging Institute. Uh, and uh, I will provide, or I should say, I will let each speaker provide a more detailed introduction uh, of themselves prior to their presentation. And I would like our panelists to say what colleges or universities they have attended. What are their alma maters? We'd like you to keep in mind that the people who are listening to this webinar are the people who are running food services in colleges and universities. They're uh, student services. Uh, they run dormitories. They're trying to get aluminum cans and bottles out of the trash from student trash. They're trying to get uh, professors and department administrators to pull their papers and boxes out of the trash and get them recycled. So um, give us at least a glimpse into your personal experience with living and studying on campuses. We'll also be introducing a brief poll asking for the market values uh, or costs that you might ha have to pay. And uh, hopefully, we'll have those results to you um, at the end of the, uh, by the end of the webinar. 
So when you do see those five or six poll questions come up, if you could just take a minute and report whether you are paying or getting paid for each of the market commodities. If you have single stream recycling, obviously you're not going to answer for paper bottles and cans or cardboard. You just answer for single stream recycling. Uh, and we would ask you also to note the amount you're paying for trash removal services. What is your tipping fee? All right. Uh, we're just going to give a few quick housekeeping details before we conduct the webinar. Uh, let's see. Uh, and I'll try to go through this as quickly as possible. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, you can call GoToWebinar's customer support line at 800-263-6317. That's 800-263-6317. This is a telephone and VOIP call. Everyone automatically enters the call with the microphone and speakers option with the sound muted. Uh, so we're, we're going to be staying in listen-only mode. If you experience sound quality issues, please try hanging up and dialing back in. I would also invite you to turn off your cell phones and keep them away from your phone. We found that that can cause some feedback. Um, what else? Um, you, you might try hanging up and calling back in. Sometimes the problem will clear up when you, when you start fresh. Um, and let's see. So when you have a question, click the plus sign next to the word question on your control panel. Type in your question and click send. If you don't see the question box on your control panel, try clicking on the tools menu at the top of the panel, then click question section, selection. You can type in a question at any time. We'll be sure to get back to you uh, if you have a question. If not, in the course of this, uh, today's program, then by email later on. Uh, any other concerns you might have can be addressed by using the chat function, which is at the bottom of your control panel. Click on the plus sign, type in your chat message, and make sure to send it uh, to the appropriate person by using the pull-down menu at the bottom of the pane. We'll be recording the audio so that you can review or um, share it with your colleagues later on. And the PowerPoints can be viewed at your leisure later or forwarded to anyone else to be viewed through the Kirk website. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ted Siegler and Natalie Starr from DSM. So take it away, uh, Natalie and or Ted. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. This is Ted Siegler. Uh, Natalie has a cold, which I'm hoping I'm not going to catch. Um, I first want to say that uh, we've, we've had the distinct pleasure of sorting uh, very wet garbage and recycling with Rob in Cambridge. Uh, and, and know Rob quite well, and it's a pleasure to have a chance to participate in this. Uh, Rob asked uh, where we went to school. Um, it was a long time ago for me, but I, I have my undergraduate degree from the University of New Hampshire and my master's from the University of Nevada at Reno. You can probably figure out that I'm a skier. Uh, and Natalie, also being a skier, uh, spent her undergraduate days at the University of Vermont and uh, got her master's from Antioch. Uh, we have worked on uh, uh, college recycling programs for Tufts, uh, UMaine, most recently University of, of uh, Massachusetts at Amherst, UVM in Vermont, and Champlain College. So that is a way of introduction. And if you can go to the next slide, um, I think that the disclaimer is that we are uh, resource economists specializing in recycling, but we do not uh, say that we are experts in any one material. Um, like our panelists, and we don't buy or sell materials. But we have dealt with all of the materials and costs at all stages in the management system, from collection through processing, reclamation, and end use. Next slide. I, I think that uh, while this uh, webinar is devoted to the markets and the impact that the markets have on uh, your decisions to uh, on what to recycle. Being economists, we, we kind of try, tend to divide things into what at the microeconomic level, why would you recycle, and then at the macroeconomic uh, level, obviously at the microeconomic level, what's it going to cost you? And if it cannot be justified from a pure cost basis, we know that for lots of uh, universities, uh, you might justify it because of environmental or sustainability 
uh, or other reasons, including student or faculty demand. Um, on the macroeconomic analysis, uh, if we collect the material because we generate enough or, or our students demand it, can we find a reliable market for the material? And today's presentation is really going to talk um, primarily about the macroeconomic level, and, and we're going to start on the next slide on that. As we, as, as we said, I guess I have one more slide on the micro stuff first. Um, the primary microeconomic analysis issues are there may be internal re oops, we're <laughs> I got to figure out what slide you're on here. There are internal reasons to manage materials. For example, recently we did a, a study for the University of Maine and the distance to the nearest single stream MRF is 140 miles from Orno, that may really impact on what decisions uh, you may make about how they manage and organize recycling. There may also be union issues at many uh, colleges which uh, restrict what your options are, and there may be storage issues at, at many institutions uh, associated, associated with what materials you can keep separate. There also may be external factors. Uh, a lot of universities are part of a, lo a large multi-location institution like the University of Maine, and decisions be may be made uh, for the entire state as opposed to individual locations. Uh, there may be local fire regulations or environmental restrictions which restrict what you can do on campus. Uh, we're going to ignore all of these very real issues today because we want to look primarily at the macroeconomic issues associated with recycling. Next slide. So what are some of the external factors or macro issues that you really need to look at? Uh, and how do they affect your decisions concerning recycling? And you'll hear about these in, in much more depth from all of the panelists. But we broke them into uh, six categories. Global demand for resources, uh, the underlying price of oil and gas, uh, the U.S. economy and demand, East and West Coast import issues, processing or end-use demand and capacity, and regulatory and environmental issues. We're going to start with uh, global demand for resources on the next slide. I think it's a fair thing to say, um, and we've been saying it for some time now, that there is a huge population worldwide now chasing resources. And when you have an increasing population and, just as importantly, increased per capita consumption, there's a huge increase in the demand for materials worldwide. As you'll see from some of the slides that Bill Moore uh, put up later on, paper and paperboard demand in Asia uh, rivals the U.S. and Western Europe now. And I just was reading a plastics uh, in packaging article that says said that 53% of Unilever's revenues from what they call fast-moving consumer goods was in emerging markets, primarily in Asia. And that is really starting to drive uh, overall demand for materials uh, in the United States because we really live in a global economy. In addition to that, as we continue to extract resources, we're going after uh, less and less uh, uh, homogeneous resources, and there are a lot of reasons why it's getting more and more difficult to extract those resources. Uh, and in some cases, we have political constraints. For example, the rare earth metals can, are controlled primarily by China, making recycling of electronics even more attractive than they might be. Bottom line, more pay people chasing limited resources equals more demand uh, for materials. And as you'll see in some of the other slides by the other panelists, the trend lines for materials values are clearly trending up over time, and we would expect that they would continue to do that. Moving on to oil and gas prices, um, they especially impact pla uh, plastic and glass prices. Plastic because uh, oil, uh, natural gas is a primary input for, for plastic. Glass prices because of the amount of energy involved in producing uh, glass. Uh, and so increasing oil and natural gas prices will continue to increase the value of recycled materials, including plastic and glass. And decisions about the environmental impact of uh, hydrofracking, for example, to extract more natural gas in the United States or the Keystone Pipeline for tar sand could have a large impact over time on the availability and price for petroleum and natural gas not to mention the uh, worldwide uh, potentials with war and, and disruption in most of the Mideast. So I think it's a fair uh, guess that we're looking at 
a time of increasing oil and natural gas prices over time, uh, although it may fluctuate in the short term, and that's going to uh, positively impact on the value of materials recycled. However, on the downside, recycling requires collection and transportation and associated fuel input, and uh, there are limits to how far we can ship glass, for example, and there are collection issues and costs associated with uh, collecting and consolidating lightweight plastic especially. Next slide. The U.S. economy and demand in the past, we would have said, well, the amount of the, the demand for recycling uh, in the U.S. depends primarily on consumption in the U.S., um, but with the down, uh, downturn in the economy, there's less demand for both raw and recycled feedstock uh, in the United States. And the reduction in imports of, of consumer goods in the United States means less container ships coming to the U.S. and therefore less ships looking to fill cargoes on the return. Um, this is something I think that's really critical, and you'll hear this from the other panelists. Consumption in the U.S. is down in part um, because we have annual, huge annual trade deficits. And I had to stick in a little economic theory here. Keynesian theory would argue that unless we export more than we import, job creation will not occur at any significant level, and I think we've been seeing that. And so when we export recyclables and import finished goods, we are really contributing to our trade deficit, and we really need to increase our supply of quality recycled materials to our domestic markets, even if we receive slightly less than the export markets in a price. Going on to domestic demand. As, as I've said before, each of the panelists will tell you all of the domestic manufacturers need additional supply of recyclables. They all save energy by using recyclable materials, and they allow them to meet minimum content standards. But they not, may not be able to pay as much as export markets, especially on the coast, and quality is especially important to our domestic uh, mills. Next. As I said, export markets have really been driving the price for secondary materials, and we would expect that to continue. Uh, Asia especially. I, I do, uh, DSM does a lot of international work. I just got back from Central Asia working over there for a couple weeks, and I can tell you that, that they have, as, as probably many of you know, relatively low-cost labor, much lower environmental and worker health and safety standards, uh, and this allows these export markets to pay higher prices for lower quality material. Uh, they can sort material cheaply, and they can dispose of residues cheaply. Um, but on the plus side, in, in China especially, there has been investment in modern paper mills especially that can handle lower quality material in some cases than the, than the U.S. And the reason we put this slide in here is that what this tells you is that uh, it's easy to simply rely on shipping lower quality bales uh, as export as opposed to making sure that you have higher quality uh, to supply to, to domestic manufacturers who really need that material. Next slide. Processing and end use capacity, this is obviously an important uh, consideration for every college or university. Where's the, where's the nearest uh, place that you can send your material? Um, the trend in the United States is clearly towards larger and more capital intensive single stream MRFs. Uh, what that means is that once these MRFs are in operation, the marginal cost of adding more tonnage may be quite low, which means that they really are seeking additional material. Um, but in some cases, the ability for them to add new materials that weren't designed into the facility may be difficult, and we're seeing that in some cases with the addition of rigid plastics, for example. Uh, in some cases, it's easy because they plan for it, and others, it's not so easy because they haven't. You, you need to ask yourself as a university or college, realistically, is it worth the effort, extra effort to keep it separate and manage it yourself, or would it be less costly to uh, co-mingle materials and ship it to a, a nearby MERV. It depends on your location. It may depend on whether there are local recycling reliant uh, manufacturers or brokers who can use your material as opposed to shipping it to a single stream or a dual stream MERV. Finally, on the regulatory and en environmental side, um, in the past, many states were, have been able to subsidize recycling through landfill surcharges. But declining landfill tonnages make that difficult today, and reduced uh, tipping fees associated with those declining tonnages 
make it difficult to justify your costs based solely on avoided disposal cost savings. Um, the decline or flat recycling rates in the United States have generated a lot of discussion about extended producer responsibility for paper and packaging, and that will certainly continue to be on the table. Um, but in the short run, uh, I think it's fair to say that those are those are long, they're, they're a ways away, and in the short run, there's a real need for everyone, uh, including colleges and universities, to increase the amount of material that they're generating. And then finally, I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't point out that electronics recycling, which is a huge issue, is, is uh, a big issue where colleges and universities can do more. In short, despite weak consumer spending and demand in the United States, uh, their Asian economies continue to grow. Domestic manufacturers need more supply, uh, but they need quality material. And the question is whether you can design and implement a sustainable program at your institution. This is a microeconomic niche issue, not a market issue. From a, from a pure market point of view, all of the materials that you're looking at, uh, the markets are there and demanding more material, both in the U.S. and internationally. I've got just a couple more slides uh, from, to, for you to look at from a, from a micro point of view. Uh, these are some of the issues that you need to ask yourself when you're saying, well, should we add another material or should we expand recycling? Uh, what types of materials do you have available? Can you store and transport them economically? Uh, can you control contamination? What are your distance to markets? What are the costs and benefits of keeping them separate versus mixing them together? Uh, and are you really doing full cost accounting uh, so that you really know what your costs are for managing recycling as opposed to solid waste? Next slide. Um, and one of the things we always say is you can't manage what you don't know. Uh, there's, there's certainly plenty of opportunity at the, at the college and university level to involve students in uh, figuring out how much you really generate, uh, knowing what types of material uh, are available that you haven't been able to go after. Uh, that's one of the reasons we were sorting in Cambridge with Rob is trying to figure out how much more material was in the garbage can. Um, and then what can you do to minimize uh, contamination on the collection issue? Uh, can you design collection containers to minimize contamination? And can you adequately educate your students and faculty to minimize contamination? Next slide. Distance to markets can have an impact, as we pointed out before. Uh, UMaine has a long drive to get their materials to markets, but many of you are located in urban areas or in areas that have uh, local markets uh, that are, are close and you may be able to keep materials separate and earn a lot of, a fair amount of money by doing that. Um, if you can't keep it separate then there may be nearby MRFs that are attractive because of the breadth of the materials that they accept and the ability for you to therefore commingle all of your materials together which makes it a lot easier from a collection point of view on the campus to uh, collect that material and deliver it to a single location. Next slide. Full cost accounting, obviously in order for you to do it, you really need to be looking at what your costs are to manage solid waste and uh, what the marginal and full cost of parallel recycling programs will be and can you invest or do more internally to make sure that the markets are more accessible uh, to the material that you generate. And all those issues are really important to you uh, when you're looking to uh, supply more materials to the markets. And in closing, on the next slide, at the macro level, even with a fall in the U.S. consumption, global demand will likely uh, continue to grow. Uh, both Natalie and I feel fairly strongly that, that the likelihood that markets are going to collapse for uh, materials is, is low and that uh, your willingness to supply more, more material both for, dom for domestic use and for export is uh, a reasonable one. Uh, the, the question becomes, how much is it going to cost you to uh, collect and handle the material? And uh, can you make good decisions about what those costs are uh, based on the composition and quantity of materials you have and your understanding of the regional capacity uh, to use that material in the area that you're located. Now I'm going to turn it over to the other panelists 
to talk specifically about their materials. Well, thank you very much, Ted. That was awesome. And one of the frustrating things about this format is that you can't hear the thunderous applause that would be rolling through the auditorium right now uh, because I thought that was an awesome presentation. We do have time for one quick question. And it's a question that came in from Joseph Floyd. What about the higher residual rates at single stream MRFs? Shouldn't that be an important consideration as well, Ted and Natalie? Yes, yes it is. And, and uh, it's, it's a large concern to, to a number of people, including the markets that are going to be giving presentations now. Uh, we come at it from the collection point of view, and um, we believe that the that the commingling of materials generates substantially more material and, and often makes sense because of the extra material you get. We also have, while you hear horror stories of, of residual rates of 30 to, to 40 percent, we can tell you, having sorted at a number of single stream MRFs, that uh, residual rates of 5 to 12 or 15 percent are, are more in the range of what, what you see for residual rates. And there is a lot of work at the single stream MRF level to reduce their residuals. Uh, many of the single stream MRFs that have contracts with municipalities have contractual obligations in, order, in, in terms of what uh, the residual rate is. But much more needs to be done. There, there is certainly work that needs to be done to keep uh, plastic out of paper bales and paper out of plastic, uh, to, reduce, to, to reduce the amount of glass that's broken and, and incorporated in other materials. But almost all of the major MRF operators are working on those issues. And uh, we're pretty confident that over time, uh, those issues are going to continue to be uh, reduced over time as every Good ones looking to recover a larger quantities of better quality material. Well, thank you very much, Ted. That was awesome. Now it's time to hear from Steve Alexander uh, and Dave Cornell, I understand, from the Association of Post-Consumer Plastic Recyclers. And uh, take it away, Steve. Uh, thank you very much, Larry. Um, uh, my name is Steve Alexander. Um, I run the Association of Post-Consumer Plastic Recyclers. Um, we uh, represent 97% of the processing capacity uh, for post-consumer plastics in North America. So essentially, um, uh, plastics recycling is done by our membership. Um, uh, I have uh, Dave Cornell, our technical director, here, who is here with us and who has been uh, recognized as one of the, uh, uh, the leading experts on uh, particularly PET recycling um, in the world. Uh, and he's going to uh, run through uh, some slides for us today. Um, unfortunately, we have a time constraint. We're just finishing up our annual meeting, and we're going to have to shoot out of here in about 20 minutes. I apologize for that. If people have questions, we're happy to follow up with them after today, or we'll be happy to participate in a future webinar. Um, for Larry's request, I'm a graduate of the University of Rhode Island. I have a master's degree from Loyola University in Baltimore, Maryland. I've done postgraduate work at MIT and the University of Delaware. Dave? I'm Dave Cornell, University of Delaware, University of Cincinnati. Let's proceed. Next, next slide. There we go. I wanted this slide to be present to let folks know that there's a long-term growth in the collection of recyclable plastics. Over the last 20 years, we've been averaging seven, over the last 20 years, we averaged seven percent a year growth rate. There are years where it's greater or lesser, but it's always been positive. We've been seeing growth in not only bottles, but into collection of rigid materials and other materials. Plastics recycling is a relatively new activity. It hasn't, doesn't have a 50, 100 year history because plastics don't have that long a history. Folks think plastics can't be recycled. Believe me, they can. And there are ex excellent prices being achieved by those folks who sell clean bales of generic resin plastics. Next slide, please. In 2000, we're going to quote 2009 numbers. The 2010 numbers were just published yesterday. Uh, I'll make a little reference to them. But the 2009 numbers have a story that's very consistent with what we saw in 2010. The total pounds collected were 2.5 billion pounds. In the case of PET, that's soda bottles, but lots and lots of other kinds of bottles 
1.4 billion pounds with a collection rate of 28 <coughs> percent. High density polyethylene is laundry products and milk bottles and food bottles, essentially a billion pounds with a 29 percent uh, collection rate. The important point about these two resins is they constitute 96 percent of all the bottles that are produced. Our 2010 numbers are fairly similar with regard to the rates and a little greater uh, tonnage of collected materials. Now, this is bottles. We also do collect films, and we, there's uh, 800 million pounds of films that are collected, over 800 million pounds of films, and we have uh, an APR uh, been very active in initiating and encouraging the collection of other plastic packaging materials. Next slide, please. There is some downsides. That that we collect, we don't necessarily process. In 2009, we exported 43% of the collected material. And as Ted suggested, economically, that is not good for the United States. 55% of the collected PET was exported, 24% of the high-density polyethylene. In 2010, we actually exported a little less. Our domestic markets were able to compete financially and otherwise in service with the, the uh, export markets, and we were able to keep more of the material in the United States. Now, we do import material, and that tells you that plastics recycling just as the recycling of other materials is an international business. Materials flow back and forth across borders, finding their best markets. Overall, we need to keep more of the collected material in the United States. And as Ted pointed out, this is good economics. It's good environmentally. We're not spending a lot of uh, energy shipping things where, frankly, they can be processed more close to home. Next, please. Our number one issue is quality. The quality adversely affected by errant contamination and the quality adversely affected by bad design. The first is one that you folks have some, uh, some say about. The second, you folks also have a say about, and we wish you would be loud in your comment. When so much material does go offshore, less discerning buyers uh, allow the quality to, to go down and the quality of the material that stays in the states suffers. The domestic buyers see, for instance, in a bale of PET, about 75% PET. That doesn't mean 25% is thrown away. It means it isn't what it was purchased to be. Just like the good farmer, uh, the PET recyclers will recover as much of the other materials and sell them. A good example is the closure. APR has an active program and has actively advocated leaving the closures on the bottles. We say keep the caps on the bottles uh, if your baler can handle it, because the, those caps uh, are recycled, they do come back into commerce, and you will see them when you go to Home Depot and you buy a can of paint. 78% of the high density bale is high density. Therefore, we have an issue with residue in the uh, uh, bale. Some of that is part of the bottle design. Some of it is errant material that's been included. So it's important to get the best prices to have uh, clean, meaning the material in, uh, requested, in the bale. Helping us with a bowling ball isn't good. Next, please. Part of the uh, non-PET, non-high density is due to the labels and closures. And as I just said, closures are OK. In fact, we actually want them. But we want the right closures. Closures that are made of the wrong materials are problematic. Additives that are wrong and layers that are wrong in the construction are problematic. Look-alike resins are problematic. How do you, as university uh, participants, deal with this? Our request is that you tell the, the marketers, you tell the folks who uh, who are putting materials uh, into your hands, the brand companies, to please adhere to the Design for Recyclability guidelines. APR has published guidelines for over 15 years indicating how best to make a bottle to make it more recyclable. We are also uh, 
creating guidelines for other kinds of plastic packaging besides bottles. Next, please. Second biggest question or issue is collection. And I'm sure the other participants are going to have a very similar statement. We collect bottles in the United States by basically three methods. Deposits, including the container redemption value, such as for California, curbside collection, and drop-off. In the case of plastic bottles, curbside collection is the primary uh, method for collecting the most tons. Next, please. And to be successful in curbside recycling, and this also includes drop-off recycling in uh, uh, university settings, you have to have three successes. There are three, three factors that are multiplied together to tell you what your collection rates possibly could be. You must have a program. If there's no program, the rest doesn't matter. People must participate. And when they participate, they must be efficient in their participation. So if we look at those three factors and say 61%, 66%, and 70%, that turns out to result in 29% collection rate, which, by the way, happens to be about that for high-density polyethylene which is collected by curbside recycling almost exclusively. Next, please. So we have about 60% of the population included in curbside programs. Can we get more? Well, understand what that means. Providing services in rural areas, providing services in densely populated areas, including such things as dormitories, including services in high-rise apartment houses. That has those latter non-suburban uh, households have been a target for at least 30 years. And it's not that we haven't tried to find ways of doing it. It's that that is a very tough thing to do, both economically and efficiently. We might get some improvement in the percent of the population that has a program available to them. And that program, of course, has to be convenient. And in your world, in the university, the program that you have has to be convenient to the people who have items that would go into it. Secondly is the, the uh, part of the population that is participating. Roughly speaking, that's about two-thirds. In university settings, it's probably better because the students are better motivated than some folks in other venues. We might see some improvement there overall. Certainly, we would hope that to see improvement in uh, the university setting. The third one is the one that is most uh, problematic and perhaps the area for greatest opportunity, the personal efficiency. If I participate by putting one bottle in the bin once a year, I get a gold star for participation, but my efficiency is terrible. So it's really important that the students and that folks outside the university setting understand that they need to put all of their proper containers into the bins. We're talking about putting all the beverage containers, all of the containers that are compatible with the existing system. And we want that to be an increasing number of packaging opportunities. Education really matters. The unfortunate fact is education costs money and its half-life isn't very long. So education has to be maintained, or people have to be elsewise motivated. Next, please. Curbside collection, people recognize iconic items, like a soft drink bottle, or a water bottle, or a milk bottle. And that helps the efficiency. The less a bottle looks like one of the icons, the less likely the public is to see it as recyclables. And the farther away from a bin a bottle is emptied, the less likely it is to find the, the bin. So bins must be available and convenient. They must uh, be so marked as folks understand that they are uh, uh, the place to put their packages. Next, please. So let's do a little what ifing. What if 85% of the population had a program available? And in the case of the university setting, that's pretty reasonable. What if 90% participated? We hope that's pretty reasonable. And what if they got it right 90% of the time putting their bottles in the bin? Well, if you multiply those three factors together, you get 61% collection rate. 
and that's close to what we see in the deposit state situations. Deposit states only address a specific category of packaging. We'd like to expand to get more than just what deposit law uh, address, what the deposit laws address. So it's very important in the voluntary collections, such as curbside and drop off, and their variants at the university setting, that we have participation and we have efficiency on the part of the students. Next, please. Are there markets? Yes, there are markets. Uh, markets aren't our problem, but supply of good material is. Upcycle and downcycle and right cycle, there is no right use for this that uh, all the recycled material should go to. The proper use is the most valuable use. To pick and assign that all recyclables have to go in one end use or another is a suboptimization, and that hurts both environmentally and economically. Next, please. In terms of where do materials go, for those who are interested in such things, in the case of PET, 37% go to fibers. That's the dominant use of PET worldwide. 28% of the bottles that are collected end up going back into a food bottle or a non-food bottle. And this is a growing area with over 100 FDA letters of no objection allowing the reuse of recycled PET into food applications. 14% go into films, and films go into thermoform packaging, and those in turn are being recycled, a rapidly growing area of application. Strapping, 12%. Strapping is a high value added use for recycled PET, and it itself is recycled. Next, please. High density polyethylene, it came from a bottle, 45% go back to a bottle. It's a steady demand because of decisions made on including recycled content in bottles, and we encourage recycled content. Pipe applications is a growth market. It's taking a quarter of all the recycled high-density polyethylene. High-density polyethylene goes into automotive applications where it helps the uh, gas mileage, uh, corporate average uh, fuel efficiency and recycle content mandates by the manufacturers. Plastic lumber and plastic railroad ties. Growth area with high performance requirements. Railroad ties must uh, endure a very harsh environment and the plastic road ties do. Next please. Low density polyethylene. We collect over 850 million pounds a year in this country. We send most of it offshore. Uh, it is used in uh, recycled trash bags to comply with state laws, and it's also uh, used in plastic lumber, that that's not sent out of the country. As Ted pointed out, MRFs aren't not necessarily built to handle all things, and films are one of those things they oftentimes are not built to handle. MRF operators are very ingenious folks and have learned, in some cases, how to benefit from the presence of the films and therefore collect and sell them. Elsewise, we end up with collection systems that are somewhat quaint, thereby uh, uh, giving a great opportunity for someone to come up with a way of collecting more film material than just through the grocery store bag collection. This is a growth area and an opportunity area for students, learning and figuring out how to take advantage of the fact that this is a valuable material that's been underappreciated. Next, please. Polypropylene is another valuable material. We do recycle the bottle caps. They go to paint cans, as I said. Used bottles go into buckets, crates, and pallets. It's a growing application for polypropylene into packaging. There's going to be more of it because it does such a fine job of certain attributes that aren't met by other plastics. Unfortunately, there's no iconic package like the PET soda bottle or high density. That makes it a little more difficult to pick one of these items out of a, a mass and say, ha ha, I know it's polypropylene. Again, this is a growth opportunity for an entrepreneur. This is an opportunity for uh, securing a very versatile, very valuable plastic for which there are lots and lots of end use applications. There's a high demand for the material. We simply don't have enough of it. Other plastics, the key is always getting enough. You have to have a critical mass to make us a business. That critical mass constitutes roughly 400 million pounds in the marketplace. There aren't a lot of applications that have that much. 
uh, recycling is, has to be appreciated that it's a business. It's not a hobby, and it's not a charity, and it's not a spiritual pursuit. It's an investment where people invest their time and money and expect a return. They also have to pay bills and pay taxes. So they do what makes economic sense. They're very versatile, uh, entrepreneurial uh, business people, and they're looking for more material to work with. So I believe we're done, unless I'm wrong. Thank you very much, Dave and Steve. Uh, that was very informative, and I know you have a plane to catch, but there's a very interesting question that came in from Joel Ostroff, which is that uh, how do we get manufacturers to, how do we communicate with manufacturers that uh, we want them to design their bottles in a way that complies with your uh, design for recyclability guidelines? We don't even know how to reach the manufacturers. On the what label would you there is that we yeah, there are two easy accesses. The label itself on the bottle frequently has an 800 number. Call them up. Tell them you want it. If you don't find the 800 number, go to their website. They'll have a uh, contact us with your comment and questions. It's an excellent venue because you'll leave a message that will reverberate. The more folks that tell them, we want uh, we like the product, but we'd like the package to be more recyclable, and we understand there are things to, that can be done to make that happen. The more pressure is brought to bear to get it right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dave. I really appreciate that insight, and I think you've just uh, uh, set the action agenda for environmental clubs on campuses across the United States. So uh, happy landings to you. And we turn the mic, now before I turn the mic over to um, Bill Moore, I uh, will need to uh, apologize. We don't have the poll ready today. Um, I was trying to get more information out of you than would fit in the format. So we will be sending out uh, via email a request to Kirk members to log on to a SurveyMonkey poll, very brief poll, that will ask you uh, for the market values you're getting paid or paying for different commodities of recyclables as well as trash tipping fees. So, um, Bill, take it away, and again, uh, your alma maters, please. Yes, good afternoon, uh, and thanks for this opportunity. Uh, first, uh, Moore & Associates uh, is a recovered paper, paper recycling consultant firm, and our, our specialty is the world and U.S. Uh, recovered paper markets. We're based out of Atlanta. Uh, a lot of our work is in the U.S. and North America, but we're also uh, quite global. I, I went to college. I I'm the undereducated one here. I only have a bachelor's uh, in engineering. I went to a specialty engineering school by the name of Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey, just outside of New York City. So with that, we'll uh, move right to the next slide into the core of the presentation. I'm going to talk about three general areas, uh, macro supply and demand issues, some history on pricing, and then and where I see the market going. Next slide, please. Ted Sigler uh, uh, mentioned this slide, and, and this is a big picture of the world by regions and the consumption of paper products. And you can see that over time, uh, paper use continues to go up. We had a, certainly had a dip in the, uh, the depths of the recession in 09 and into 010. But important for uh, our purposes uh, are two things. One, look at North America in red on the bottom. Uh, we're, we're flat to declining in terms of paper usage. So is Europe. And then you see the growth in the Asian uh, com uh, countries up above, especially the yellow in China. And this is where we start. You, you make paper uh, before you can recover it. And uh, the world uses about 50% recycled fiber content in its paper. So that tells you where the different supply and demand comes from. Next slide. This next slide shows what kind of fiber is utilized. And you can see the big dark blue area uh, that's somewhat more than 50% of the world's uh, papers made from recycled fiber. And it's been increasing slowly over the last 50 last 10 years and will 
continue to increase slowly. Uh, and it's at the expense of, of virgin made paper. Chemical pulp and mechanical pulp are, uh, are, are virgin sources made from trees. And uh, the other is primarily uh, a vegetative waste, uh, bag ass, uh, sugar cane, things like that. Next slide, please. Here's the picture for us in the, in the US. Uh, our paper consumption is going down. You can see from 1980 to 2000, we were steady use and increase uh, of, of paper production uh, in North America, and, and the US being the largest piece of North America. And then you notice in 2005, it went down further. And in 2010, it's gone down even more. And our forecast going forward is we are going to produce less paper. Uh, we not only produce less paper, but we're using less paper. And primarily, we're using less paper in the newspaper and in the printing and writing office papers area. Our packaging use of paper uh, is still growing. Next slide. Yet for the last several decades, recycled fiber has had a distinct cost advantage over virgin fiber everywhere in the world. And that's why uh, many tissue products, uh, corrugated box materials, which is what container board is, and box board is shoe box, pizza box, solid boxes, uh, the economics just favored recycled fiber. And most of the world's new capacity that went in over the last 20 years was based on recycled fiber. Uh, the economics of producing, printing, and writing slash office papers have always favored virgin pulp and, and still do. Uh, Increasing recovered paper costs, which are good for the market and for the collection of materials uh, in the U.S., over the next 10 years will probably take away some of that uh, cost dynamic. Next slide, please. Before I go into a little bit of depth, and ONP, by the way, is old newspapers, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, uh, since we're reading less newspapers, and I especially suspect so on college campuses, uh, that you don't see a whole lot of newspapers around anymore. Uh, the U.S. It does have strong forests and virgin fiber content, and we're, we have a nicely balanced mix between the use of recycled fiber and virgin. Many of the Asian companies or countries are what we call fiber short. India and China cut the vast majority of their forests thousands of years ago. And even in such places as Indonesia, where Indonesia where is forest rich, it's short fiber that's good for printing and writing papers, but not good to make newsprint or, or boxes out of. This slide uh, shows uh, US old newspaper supply. And if you look at that first column, and this goes uh, back about 10 years and, and forward about five. And uh, you can see in 2004 in the red, 17 and a half million tons of newspapers were available for recovery. If you look uh, where we are right now in 2011, we're down to uh, only 9 million. We've, we've, we've used 8 million less tons of newspaper. And we think that's going to continue. If you look out at 2015, going to continue to go down. And, and maybe that's even an optimistic number. If you look all the way over on the right-hand side at what we produce, uh, we peaked out in 2006 with just over 11 million tons of recovered OMP. We're down to all around 6.5, 7 million. Uh, but the world still has a demand for the material, not so much in North America. And in order to do that, if you look at the center column, our recovery rate has to continue to increase, peaking out at an astronomical 84% uh, in order to meet the 2015 uh, demand. Next slide, please. Situation is very much the same in uh, printing and writing. P and W is the uh, is the short uh, abbreviation for it. Uh, there's been a lag time. Newspapers were the first ones to turn down, but now office papers are, are turning down fairly drastically too. And again, if you look at the left hand side column number, the available uh, highlighted in red, our peak year was 2006 at over 32 million tons of printing and writing papers uh, available for use in the US. Uh, fast forward to where we are now, we're already down 9 million tons to 23. And looking out another 9 or 10 years, we're, we think we're going to lose at a minimum 3 or 4 million. That's probably going to be worse. Uh, uh, the, the paperless office and the paperless campus uh, are, are, are not here. 
but clearly the paper less office uh, and uh, home and campus are actually households are using a little bit more printing and writing and office paper because of uh, the use of printers. And if you come over to the right hand side, again, the same thing we saw in newspapers and newsprint, uh, we peaked out in our, our uh, recovery at 16 and a half million in uh, around 2007. We're down to about 13 million now. And again, the demand is going to slowly increase. And with the, what's available to recover, the uh, recovery rate's got to go up. So the message here is the same from all of the materials pretty much. Uh, we need more uh, recovery of, uh, of materials, and, and college campuses are certainly one of those. Although uh, I, I suspect the downturn in printing and writing papers is, is very acute on college campuses. Uh, again, it's really a transition to uh, use of electronics, and uh, uh, young people are early adopters of electronics, and uh, the readership of newspapers in the uh, 18 to 25 year old category is minimal. You know, the only growing uh, newspaper in the United States is the Wall Street Journal, and I suspect there's not a lot of Wall Street Journal uh, hard copy uh, readership uh, on uh, college campuses. But of course, uh, old corrugated containers, uh, corrugated boxes, are something that grows with the economy and is not affected by uh, the downturn in these other papers. So that's a, that's always a good recoverable. Uh, on college campuses. Next slide, please. And turning to looking at some pricing, uh, OCC is old corrugated boxes. Uh, and if we look at this uh, pricing long term on half year basis, we, we see the big downturn in the uh, first half of uh, 2009. That was the real depth of the recession, the credit lockup, and prices fell like a stone uh, in the third, fourth quarter of 08 and the first quarter of 09. But then we had a rapid recovery. And, and you can see, although the economy didn't uh, come up as rapidly and unemployment certainly stayed high, uh, recovered paper prices, OCC on, on this chart, came up rather nicely. And uh, as of the first half of this year, we exceeded where we were in 2008. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the short-term uh, situation in a little bit. Next slide. You see the same sort of thing here for uh, old newspapers. Uh, although prices are less and less volatile because old newspapers suffer from what we call supply short, and it doesn't turn down as deeply. But again, you can see in the, in the depth of the early part of the recession, uh, prices really fell all the way down from $128. Uh, and these are prime la large user prices average across the US or large sellers went from $128 a ton down to 59 But again, uh, rather rapid recovery in the first half of this year. We were all the way back up to 154 which was just about a record. Next slide, please. Mixed paper uh, is an increasing commodity. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, the global nature of this business. 30% uh, of all paper collected in the United States is now going offshore. And that's the biggest change I've seen in my 25 years in the business. 25 years ago, uh, export uh, to other countries was a few percent and, and mostly into Canada. And now we're up to 30%, which does include Canada and Mexico. You can see mixed paper is a more volatile commodity because there are less markets to it. 60% uh, of mixed paper, and mixed paper is just that, it's every other thing paper mixed together, and 60% of it goes offshore, and the majority of that, 70%, goes to China. So uh, we're in the hands of China when it comes to uh, mixed paper markets, and, and really all paper markets. Uh, what China does in any of the grades of paper uh, reflect in the market worldwide. Next chart, please. When we look at driver variables of what pushes uh, pricing, the general economy is, is extremely important. Disposal costs have some impact. The cost to recovery does. Mill industry operating rates, how, how well is the US and, and world industry operating. Virgin pulp prices, how uh, particularly for office papers, which are de-inking high grades. Uh, what is the supply doing? What is the demand doing? And then there are other things like yield on recycled fiber, comparison, wood costs, and virgin price competition, and some others. 
Next slide, please. I mentioned the U.S. liner board mill operating rates, and liner board mills are the are the mills, paper mills in the United States that make the outer covering for corrugated boxes. And uh, not surprisingly, you could almost overlay this with OCC prices and, and see some uh, some uh, real price comparisons. You can see the deep downturn after running very well in, in 2006 and 2007. By 2008, 2009, things took a pretty strong dip with a pretty good recovery in 10, although that leveled off in 11 when recovered paper prices continued to go up. Next slide, please. This is our um, short-term OCC price forecast that we put out in the beginning of September. And, uh, you know, we uh, in, in the middle of the summer, towards the end of the summer and early September, we were all trying to figure out which way is the economy going. And this was based on a 2% uh, U.S. Uh, GDP growth over the next uh, year. And our numbers now are telling us that that's going to be low, uh, that at best we're going to do 1% over the next year. And you can see uh, in, this, uh, in the last third quarter of uh, 2011, the quarter that just closed, we hit a peak of $178, which is, is a very good price. We've already had a fall off, and we thought the quarter would come in around 155. It's probably going to come in around 145. Uh, if you're getting less, you're probably getting less material uh, money for your materials because they're loose and not large quantities. But on a percentage basis, you can use these kind of numbers to figure out where things are going. Again, you can go back by quarters and look at your pricing compared to this, what I call prime pricing. We do think the bottom's not going to drop out of the market. And uh, five or six weeks ago, we, we thought things would uh, have small increases. Probably where we're sitting right now in terms of the economy is we think things are going to be flat. If the U.S. dips into a, another recession, uh, pricing won't hold up flat, will fall down. But we don't see the meltdown that we had in that fourth quarter of 08 and uh, first quarter of 09. Next slide, please. Here's a real long-range picture of uh, ONP price forecasting, just to show you a little bit what that's like. Uh, this goes back uh, all the way to 2002 in history, and you can see that, again, that downturn in 09. 2002 and 2009 were about the same. Then you see that rapid rebound. And then you see uh, going forward over, this is a 10-year forecast, a very long-range forecast. LH is likely high. LA is likely average. And LL is uh, likely low. Uh, and you can see we think really things are going to look pretty good. We don't see any of those $70 numbers. Um, and uh, right now, where the economy sits, we'd be looking more at the blue line uh, if we don't come out of the funk in terms of growth. Uh, the, uh, the green line, the average, would, would be about 2.5% uh, U.S. growth. By the way, that dip in 2017 was our forecast uh, for the next big downturn in recession. Uh, in 2013, 14, and 15, we thought we'd see modest growth uh, in the U.S. economy. Next slide. I don't know if there's any more. That was the last one, so I think we might have some time for questions or a question. Awesome, Bill. Well, yes, we do, and I really appreciate your insight into this very important market for colleges and universities. Uh, but a, a very interesting question came in from uh, Joseph Floyd. Um, do we have a chance to see greater inclusion of some of the non-traditional paper materials such as gable and aseptic containers uh, and pizza boxes and, and that kind of thing, like they're doing at Eureka Recycling in Minnesota. Um, will that help to make up for some of the drop-off in office paper demand uh, generation? Excellent question. Uh, you know, these non-traditional paper sources, I'll, I'll lump them into that term, uh, are definitely uh, new opportunities, and, and we will see more recovery of those and milk cartons and... Uh, Drink boxes, juice boxes are excellent fiber, and they will make up for some of uh, that white fiber office paper that we're not going to have. Problem is the tonnage is very small, and they do take some extra processing. Uh, but there will be great growth, and that will give us a, a, a little bit of a cushion. But it's in no way going to make up for losses of three, four, five, and seven million tons of uh, 
loss of office papers. The, the tissue people who use a lot of those office papers and uh, white fibers are very concerned about their supply of raw material. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bill. And now it's time to turn to Beth Schmidt from the from Alcoa. And Beth, again, I would like to remind you to uh, tell everybody where you went to college. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, hello, everybody. My name, is, uh, he said, is Beth Schmidt. I'm the director of recycling programs for Alcoa. And I uh, did both uh, undergraduate and postgraduate work at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, it's uh, it's really good to talk to this audience, and uh, we're, uh, the Alcoa Foundation is happy to sponsor uh, many of Kirk's uh, programs um, in, in, in large part because of the importance of the college and university audience to us uh, from a recycling standpoint. Uh, we also sponsor other college programs like Recycle Mania, for example, to help with collection of aluminum cans and other uh, materials. And it's an important audience from a couple of different standpoints. Um, first of all, because um, we think it's really important as we uh, continue to try to uh, really help drive uh, cultural change that makes recycling a, a habit, just a part of the way we live our lives, uh, reaching this audience as a lot of your lifetime habits are formed is, is really an important thing from our standpoint. And then secondly, and, and perhaps a little selfishly, as we've um, segmented the market for aluminum cans, we have a pretty good idea of where cans are sold and um, also have a pretty good idea of where they're used in terms of channels of usage. And as we segment the market to try to identify where we can uh, move the needle in terms of increasing the recycling rate. Uh, colleges and universities have been identified as a very important channel of can usage where uh, we hope to take the recycling rate up. So um, uh, on, uh, speaking on behalf of aluminum, to be honest, sometimes it's a little bit challenging for me to discuss the issue of markets because the market for aluminum, and especially aluminum cans, is, is very well established. And, it is and has been and, and will continue to be quite strong and, and a valuable component of the material stream due to the uh, enormous energy savings that the industry achieves when we um, recycle cans. Um, can pricing goes up and down uh, with the London Metal Exchange or LME price of aluminum. And uh, you know, as it goes up and down during periods of higher or lower supply and demand, uh, cans tend to uh, to float in a range of anywhere between 60 and 80 or so cents a pound uh, on a per ton basis, 1,300 to 1,750 or so uh, dollars a ton, and, and it's linked to the London Metal Exchange. Um, and, and it's also um, quite a, a fungible alloy in the sense that it can be uh, cans in particular can go into lots of different products and lots of different end markets. Um, so the the market is is pretty strong. And um, it is what's driven the industry to uh, continue to increase recycling capacity and, and to be quite active in trying to drive up the recycling rate. Um, I, I don't think there's a city or town a drop off or curbside program or a MRF that doesn't accept aluminum cans and have a pretty good um, methodology for separating those, those cans out by eddy current, um, a different sorting processes to try to help increase the value. And um, so with that said, I thought I might just show a few slides to provide sort of a backdrop. Um, and, and I also wanted to it, very quickly, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but share um, a few slides on a topic that we've been asked about a lot lately, and that is the topic of EPR, or Extended Producer Responsibility for Packaging. And uh, a lot of the states that you are in may be looking at that, and I wanted to offer perspective on how that would affect the market. So. Um, this first um, this first slide really gets to the macroeconomic um, trends that I think uh, Ted maybe mentioned at the very top of this discussion, and that is um, the fact that there are some uh, mega trends supporting a lot of future growth, global growth for aluminum, uh, urbanization, um, in, in increasing uh, mobility, and a need for um, lightweight transportation. Uh, resource scarcity, uh, and climate change, all those things are uh, really create a mandate for um, the industry to think about our material after we produce, it, produce 
waste materials as a technical nutrient or a manufactured natural resource. Another way to put it might be to call it a secondary raw material. Uh, it, it is rich in energy and we do not uh, consider it to be waste. And so that value to us, because of the energy intensity of making aluminum the first time, means that we definitely need to close the loop and get it back so that we can save that energy. Uh, most of you probably have heard this, this number. It, it's a true number. It's a significant number, and that is the fact that it takes about, it saves about 95% of the energy it takes to make virgin aluminum when you use recycled aluminum. So, so we, we can make a can a second time or a fifth time or a seventh time out of a, another can with just 5% of the energy that it took, it, to, took to make it the first time. And so that's why the recycled content for cans is, is pretty high at 68 percent and we're trying to continue to drive that higher uh, and and the problem that we've got in in this country in particular is that um, despite this value uh, we're still not um, getting nearly the cans back that we need to get so this chart that you're looking at now shows a total market worldwide of 196 billion cans uh, and which is a huge number that even more huge number is the fact that about half of those are consumed in the United States. Uh, but the, and, and we do have a, a, a relatively good recycling rate. It's 58 percent is the 2010 recycling rate for aluminum cans. But um, given that we've been at this for so many years trying to drive that rate higher, the fact that uh, 42 percent of them or almost 41 billion cans are still going into the trash um, we have the largest market for cans globally, but one of the lowest recycling rates among developed countries. If you look at, and, and, and significantly lower than many undeveloped countries, you look at uh, Brazil, for example, has a recycling rate of 98%. Um, I think Russia is at 69-70%. Um, China is in the mid to high 90s. Uh, most European countries are in the um, in the somewhere between 65 and 80 uh, to even 90 percent in the case of Germany. So there's lots of room for us to improve. Uh, to put that into perspective, if you want to go to the next slide, that means about um, 1.3 billion pounds of metal, um, just a huge amount of metal is being landfilled in the United States. And this is hard to believe, <laughs> but it's <laughs> It's uh, significant, about two smelters worth. You could replace two smelters worth of output. And, and smelters produce just thousands and thousands of tons of, of metal a year um, with the material that is still going into the landfill in the United States. And um, that's the equivalent amount of metal that could produce over 27,000 airplanes. It, it's just an enormous, uh, the order of magnitude size of waste is, is so significant it almost defies belief. And so that is what's driving our industry to try to reach out and to figure out how we can get uh, entities, what the channels of can users, whether they are in uh, individual homes in the U.S. or whether they're on college and university campuses, to increase the percentage of uh, cans that they are recovering and getting back into the market because, uh, you know, we, we do have some concern about material going offshore. I've heard a little bit about that during the course of today's discussion. I think right now only about 2 to 5 percent of the cans that are collected are going offshore, but as I, as I talk about uh, some of the issues that we're facing with the consideration for single stream programs, as quality de degrades, that number could go, go higher, and that is something that we're watching. Uh, so the, the cans aren't really going offshore, but we're still not getting nearly enough um, into the mills that are producing can sheet. Every one of the mills that make sheet that goes into new cans is short of cans right now. So it's, a, it's an important issue for the industry. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so um, I, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of the industry. I'm really just speaking on behalf of Alcoa. Uh, we do support policy initiatives that would help drive recycling rates higher. Um, in, about 40 percent of the cans that we um, get back for recycling are coming from the 10 states in the U.S. that have deposit laws. Um, I know that deposit laws, uh, as mentioned earlier, only reach a, a certain percentage of packaging. 
Um, they're uh, not uh, efficient from the standpoint of some uh, retailers and so other entities who don't want to deal with having to take those materials back, but, but they do produce a, a good, clean source of cans for us. But if, if, if it's not a deposit um, scenario that we would pursue, we would support things like disposal bans on high energy containers, uh, mandated or incentivized recycling, um, pay-as-you-throw systems that some of you may be looking at. And if you're studying policy to support uh, sustainability, uh, that, in essence, would, would uh, take um, a, a position that, you, you, you know, uh, like, like other use-based utilities, waste uh, should be use-based. The more you dispose of or throw away or waste, the more you would pay for that service. And, and it would also incentivize recycling. And then we're also uh, supportive of uh, what we would consider logical, fair, and effective extended producer responsibility. So um, given the interest, in the interest of time, knowing that we're about uh, 10 minutes away from the end of this, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, but uh, we do have five or six things that we want to make sure are embedded if you guys are looking at EPR as an approach within the states that you live. Uh, we don't want to see deposit laws replaced with EPR because we consider them a form of EPR that does deliver high uh, recycling rates. And you can move on to the next slide if you like. Um, the, um, we also want to ensure that, um, that uh, handling fees or any uh, ha handling fees embedded in the EPR would be consistent with uh, with uh, recycling rates and source reduction that's already been achieved um, and uh, would would be fair and on a, that all containers and packaging that would be embedded in such a, a model to try to drive recycling rates up would be on a level playing field. If you want to advance to the next one, I did want to talk a couple minutes about quality. Um, the free and fair markets. There is, as I said earlier, well developed, um, well developed market for aluminum cans, and we wouldn't want to see um, any legislation interfere with that market. At the end of the day, um, you can advance to the next slide. A couple of people have mentioned quality, and um, and we do see um, a significant. Um, impact in the quality that we uh, that we see coming through the bales that come from either a MRF environment or an already uh, or, or a source separated uh, bale that um, would would not have come through a commingled system um, and and we are taking an increasing amount of cans through the MRF system and also see and would concur with some of the people who've already talked today that a uh, single stream does indeed increase convenience, it increases access, and it should increase the recycling rate. Uh, but because there is about 2 to 10 or 10 or 2 to 11 percent uh, contamination coming through those single stream systems, um, it's really important that, those, that, that quality is taken into consideration in that type of an environment because in addition to um, leading to a potential for that material to have to be um, exported to another market, it also could mean that um, could mean that the material doesn't end up back in a closed loop, back it cans back into packaging, for example, cans back into cans as opposed to cans that could end up uh, going to uh, some other form of um, of aluminum products, such as building and construction, engine blocks, whatever that might be downstream, um, and th and that can happen because the the more contamination there is in a bale of cans, um, the less the upstream mills um, are able to pay for it because it requires additional secondary processing on our side. And so if, if you see the price of that bale drop, that means that there are other, other considerations that have already been mentioned. For example, the uh, logistics to get it offshore or the logistics that would um, lead those cans to end up in some other um, secondary uh, process uh, for the aluminum um, could threaten the material supply to our industry. We really want to see that loop closed 100% and want to get all the cans back into um, new can sheets. Um, if you want to advance to the next slide. And then finally, a couple of other things that, um, you, you know, regardless of whether or not it is a 
an EPR approach or any type of an approach for measuring uh, the success of any recycling program. Collection does not equal recycling. Uh, and uh, we, we believe that material specific rates uh, should be a consideration of any policy that would be um, passed down the road. And, and that incentives, um, whether it is voluntary incentives that could be put into place by uh, this audience on a college or university basis, or whether it's something that's embedded in a policy uh, within a municipality or a state, um, have to be and, and have proven to be a successful driver um, for uh, increasing recycling rates. Um, I, I do have, a, I think that may be the last, I'm not sure, I think that may be the last slide that I've got in here. Okay, there's one, one other thing, and, and the area that we're working on now is knowing that um, getting a policy or legislation to pass to help increase recovery and recycling rates is, is a stretch right now. I think it's going to, there are a lot of other things that are on the agendas of most state and municipal leaders right now, particularly given the condition of the economy. So what we're about doing now is, is reaching out to other members of the value chain, and these are all just examples of how you, you might create a coalition, a strategic partnership that's formed on a voluntary basis to help collect more cans and to drive, um, you know, a cultural movement, a cultural um, shift in terms of the way we look at packaging uh, because it is not waste, it is, it is energy uh, to our industry. It is, um, as I said, a manufactured natural resource that we really want to get back and need to get back, um, particularly in North America. Um, Depending upon where you live, you may be aware of the fact that several um, smelters in the United States have, because of high energy and electricity costs, uh, been forced to shut down. Um, Alcoa alone has closed several in the last few years. And it is not um, in the foreseeable future that we see smelters being restarted and certainly none built. And so to the degree to which we can continue to produce products efficiently and effectively um, in large part depends on getting those secondary raw materials back out of the waste stream and into the mills that can produce a new can sheet. So that it's very important to us. And, and the one thing I would ask this audience to do is I, I'd be happy to provide my email address for input in terms of what barriers are there now to, um, what bar barriers are you experiencing now in terms of your desire and ability to collect aluminum cans and to um, to, to get those cans to market effectively. Um, and so with that, I'd, if there are any questions related to aluminum, I'd be happy to answer, answer them or uh, we can go back to them a little bit later. Beth, if it's uh, okay with you, we will take, uh, have to take the questions offline because we uh, want to have time for Lynn Bragg to talk about glass recycling. Um, and uh, Lynn, if you could mention uh, your alma mater, we, uh, we will be able to go another few minutes, but um, take it away, Lynn. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Lynn Bragg. I um, received my bachelor's degree from the University of Mary Washington College in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and my master's degree from Boston University. Um, could we go to the slide um, titled about the GPI? I'm president of the Glass Packaging Institute, and we are a trade association that represents the uh, North American glass container industry. The industry is um, been greatly reduced um, over the last several decades, primarily as plastic has uh, grown in popularity as a container for, for both food and beverages, although we are trying to make a comeback here, and um, that's part of what uh, my job is. Um, we do um, appear before Congress. Uh, we uh, protect in our American jobs. Um, the industry standards, and uh, we try to promote sound energy, environmental, and uh, recycling policies. Next slide, please. So we have about 48 um, plants in 22 states. We're a little over a $5 billion industry. 
um, as you can see, we've got uh, a few furnaces, and we do produce uh, a fair amount of uh, glass containers, about 30 billion a year for food, beverage, cosmetics, spirits, wine, and beer. Um, and we have about 8,000 salaried and um, union employees. Next slide, please. Um, this slide really shows kind of an overview of our shipments and production um, for for uh, the last year, uh, January to June. And again, as you can see, and I mentioned this earlier, our uh, both our for the most part our production and shipment is down somewhat um, in the majority of categories. Although we have seen an uptick in shipments in both wine and um, some of the food categories. So um, uh, the, the economy has affected um, everyone, um, but it looks like people are still drinking some wine. So that's good for us. Um, just briefly, you've heard about this from some of the other industries, but in terms of the benefits of recycling glass, um, glass is 100% recyclable, and it can be recycled endlessly. You, if you recycle a glass bottle, and our industry can get its hands on the glass bottle, we will recycle it and make a new bottle. Over a ton of natural resources are saved for every ton of glass recycled, and our energy costs will drop about 2 to 3% for every 10% of recycled glass used in our manufacturing process. And six tons of recycled container glass um, will equal one ton of carbon dioxide reduced. So even though sometimes I know on college campuses there isn't always a lot of glass, if you do see a glass bottle, um, I just ask that you continue to think of the sustainability and all the environmental benefits of finding um, somewhere where you can recycle that glass. And next slide, please. So some of the barriers, we do face quite a few barriers to increasing our glass uh, recycling and recovery rate. And um, in 2008, our board of directors established a very ambitious goal for our industry, and that was trying to achieve a 50% recycled content goal for all of the new glass containers made um, by 2013. And it is a very ambitious goal for us. Um, you'd be surprised at how many bottles uh, don't get back into the system. Um, right, we started in 2008 at a recycled content rate of about 28%, and our numbers are showing right now that we're up to about 32% recycled content rate. So we, we, ha we do have a distance yet to travel. What we find is that there is confusion about the demand side and the supply side material um, management, and we have a lot of challenges and as well as opportunities here. And you know, like you, everyone who um, takes their trash to the curb who really thinks that it's going to be recycled when your um, when the trash truck comes around to pick it up, but that. Definitely is not the case. Um, the local and state governments are are really being challenged economically, and um, they consider their job done once the trash, once the recyclables, and all the other um, waste has been picked up. So we are what we're trying to do is really work with the haulers and others, the MRF to really consider the end market when they're collecting all of the recyclables. Next slide, slide please. So again, on the barriers, um, for us a big one is contamination. Um, we, more and more uh, municipalities and cities are turning towards single stream collection, and that is a problematic for us because glass, of course, breaks, and it does get entangled with 
a newspaper, and um, then if you get liquid in on top of that, it ends up being a big slimy mess, and um, it's very difficult to uh, pull it apart and clean it and reuse it. So as you can see from the slide, on the average, 40% of recycled glass does get to new container glass. 20% um, for single use or, or low value, um, which we call diversion, ends up, it ends up being a rose cover or rose bed. So it still is being used, but sadly, about 40% still ends up in the landfill. Next slide, please. So again, on our just looking at some of our barriers to increasing our um, recycling and recovery rates, um, you've heard um, other industries talk about the materials recovery facilities of the MRF, and I've I've already mentioned the contamination problem, um, but a lot of the MRF are looking into um, getting different different equipment that will help with the handling of glass. There is an additional cost um, in sorting the glass. And basically, all of us in, in the recycling loop for glass need to uh, come to a better understanding on the economic models and other ways to improve the handling and recovery of our recycled glass. And this is an area that we, we are continuing to work on um, as an industry. So um, our market really for, for glass are, are very are, are local. And a lot of it um, depends on um, exactly where, what state. Uh, we did, we um, just like aluminum. We have our cleanest material uh, comes from the container deposit state. So those are the 10 states. Um, and we also um, have pushed in, in some states our hotel and restaurant um, recycling programs. And those programs have been uh, very effective. In North Carolina, a, a, a law was recently passed that um, restaurants must recycle uh, their glass containers, and we've really been pleased with the results there. Um, a lot of the, the recycling efforts um, are much more efficient if a either a um, processor or a glass plant is located in that state. So. In North Carolina, for example, we do have a couple of glass manufacturing facilities in that state. So um, I'm going to sum up um, real quickly. Uh, we uh, we are working um, also to see if we can uh, develop a legislative um, consensus on Capitol Hill. We do work in coalition. Uh, with some of the other commodity in industries in terms of recycling. Uh, we're working to support uh, recycling, to especially to improve our data collection and analysis. Um, we want to make sure that um, anything, any legislation, especially at the federal level, does uh, take into account glass recycling in those end markets. Um, and we are going to continue to encourage bar and restaurant programs and reduce favor state beverage container deposit programs. So again, those are those state programs are our best source, our cleanest source of of recycled um, material for the industry. So with that, that I I'm completing my uh, presentation, and I uh, want to thank everyone uh, for your attention and attendance. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, and thanks to all of our presenters, Ted and Natalie, Steve Alexander and Dave, Bill Moore, Beth Schmidt, and Lynn Bragg. And uh, there are a couple of interesting questions that uh, you've sent in, and thank you for your questions. A question that came in from Nicholas Moe uh, that applies to glass, but I suppose it could also apply to plastic or, or aluminum. 
is anyone seeing a resurgence of interest or research in reusable uh, containers in niche markets? Uh, I would think that uh, reuse, returnable bottles uh, and cans take less energy to be refilled than uh, recycling glass, plastic, or aluminum containers. Uh, does any of you want to um, um, make a crack at answering this? Um, this is Lynn. Um, yes, we are seeing a little bit of uh, resurgence in that area. Um, in some states, like for example, I, I live in Maryland, and one of our local independent groceries now carries uh, milk in glass containers from some of the local uh, dairies. And there is a bottle, you do turn your bottle um, to be um, reused and refilled uh, back to the store. Some, some states, however, you can't, you can't do that. And you have to have a, a special certification from the FDA to be able to collect the bottles and then um, reuse them again. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting uh, uh, notion that dairies are looking to retain or even revive the use of glass bottles in the uh, reusable milk bottle market. Another interesting question came in from Aubrey Welch. How does residential collection efficiency compare to commercial glass recycling? I, I guess commercial would be restaurants, hotels, and that kind of thing. Well, um, that's a very good question also. Um, in some of the commercial um, collection systems, the, um, the establishment pre-sort. So we do get a very clean supply of glass from the bar and restaurants because they just, you know, usually they even wash it out and they put it in proper bins. So it's not really commingled as much uh, with other materials as glass would be with residential collections, which have now gone more to the single stream where you put all of your recyclables in, you know, one bin or even if you put it in a bin, sometimes when everything gets to the murk, it all gets um, mixed together, which then becomes more difficult for glass. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, that, uh, that about wraps things up. And uh, I want to remind everyone that November 10th, uh, we're having our sort of part two on markets, uh, program planning uh, with respect to or in response to the local markets we might have. And again, thanks so much to Alcoa and KAB. And behind the scenes, we've got uh, 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 a die-hard core of uh, Larry Kaufman at Keep America Beautiful and Ancha Nicolaitis at KAB also. Um, we've, we've got our team of uh, the, the webinar subcommittee, Andrew Lentini, University of Georgia, Dave Vandeventer from Clemson University, B.J. Tipton from North University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Donnie Addison from Auburn University, Christine on Colnitz Cooley from the Medical University of South Carolina, Erica Spiegel from the University of Vermont, Karen Kaplan from the University of Oregon, and Mike Udelman from University uh, uh, Stony Brook University. So thanks again to all participants and panelists. We really appreciate this uh, voluntary uh, donation of your time and expertise to help us get college students, staff, and faculty recovering the maximum amount of aluminum, paper, and, and other fiber and uh, plastics. So thanks again, and we look forward to uh, seeing you next time.